Hi, my name is Rebecca Evil. I am excited to welcome you all here today for a conversation between Laura Sanders and Otis Quinko. And uh, it's all settled around our, her forthcoming exhibition, Laura Sanders Shifting Baselines at Contemporary Art Matters in Columbus, Ohio, um, November and December of 2020. Um, I am the moderator, so I'm just going to make some quick introductions and hand the conversation off to the two painters. Um, Laura Sanders is a painter I've worked with for many years. I'm thrilled to know her and work with her and uh, be friends, and she's a, a wonderful painter and person. Um, and I've followed her paintings from the time her daughter was a young figurative a figure in her paintings till the, today. She's from um, Detroit, Michigan, lives and works in Columbus, Ohio. She got her bachelor's degree at Columbus College of Art and Design and um, was in an exhibition earlier, her first exhibition in New York this year at the uh, Marion Boski Gallery, uh, an exhibition called Xenia, Crossroads and Portrait Painting, um, where we met our other uh, guest here, Otis. So you live in Portland, Oregon now. You're just a few years, um, but you have made a huge splash in the United States in the short time that you've been here with an exhibition at the Roberts Projects in Los Angeles, a fantastic gallery. Um, and I know you have projects coming up this year in Miami Beach, Art Basel, and at the Rubel Collection. I, I've been a fan of your paintings since I got to know them over the last year, and there are uh, some in private collections here in Columbus, so I get to see them more often than you might know. Uh, <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so to start off the conversation, um, I wanted to ask you, and um, I'll start with you, Laura. The Boski Show was your first uh, exhibition in New York. How was that experience? It was fabulous, as, as you would expect. It was really great to, especially to be able to attend to the opening and um, get to meet different artists like Otis. Otis, was that your first show in New York? Yeah, it was my first show in New York, and I was, I was pretty much excited about it, but um, I also love being in group shows and being able to see other talents and other paintings as well, like uh, Laura said, that's where I also met Laura. I was just stunned by her work and um, I'm a big fan of brush strokes. So when I saw her paintings with the strokes in there, I was just like, oh my God, I'm so in love with this. But, so I was excited to be in that group show and uh, yeah, it was my first time be, uh, exhibiting in New York. Well, I was very happy to be at the opening too. And I, it was a great show with lots of really great artists. Um, but wow, what a star studded art opening too. I mean, not every show yeah. has, you know, Amy Sherald and uh, Rashid Johnson and you, you yeah. know, everybody that was cool was there. It was pretty exciting. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty exciting. And it was actually first time meeting some of the artists that you you love your works and you see the works all the time. I should not met them in person. So it, it was a nice um, 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 environment during that moment. Unfortunately, we can't do that now with COVID now, but it was it was, it was was a moment where it was spending. I know, Laura, a little bit about your background, how you got there. Um, and uh, one of the directors of the gallery, Mary um, Cecilia Mitch, is from Columbus and has followed your work for many years. How, Otis, did you get to arrive to, at that moment? How did you come to the States and how did you get to be in that show? Well, I got married and moved to the States because my wife couldn't live in Ghana with a harsh weather condition, with a fan and you know, humid. So I had to make that sacrifice and then move here. And um, how everything started was just crazy because um, leaving my country and coming to the States, it's like leaving your whole career behind that you've really established and um, moving to a different country. You, know, you don't know anybody, you only know your wife. And it's like you have to start from the scratch. 
So from the beginning, it was it was very very tough, but it was also an opportunity for me to explore around and see what's going on and see what the art world is like and all that, so that I know how I was starting, I know who to approach and who to talk to. So it it was it was very very tough from the beginning, but when I got here, art became more sort of a hobby because then you have to start working and start making money to be able to pay the bills and all that. So it was all about trying to find work first and then start getting some income because that's where you also used to buy your materials and all that. So it was it was tough from the beginning, but I also approached a couple of galleries showing my stuff. But when you are new, the hesitant is a little bit there and all that. So I I later on just um, 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 started working with FedEx for a couple of months just to make some money and all that. And then whilst I was working with FedEx, on the weekend I painted, you know, exploring different subjects, exploring um, um, what is going on, what issue can I partake in and all that. And also I tried to find out what kind of um, art committee I can join just to, you know, have the conversation going. People started getting to know more about me and asking me questions and my practice and all that. Uh, I had opportunity to go to LA where my friend Amuako had um, a resident, uh, his first exhibition where he invited me over. So that was my first encounter with Robert's project. But he didn't know I was an artist because it was just a normal conversation. A friend is having an exhibition, I'm just coming to support. And then later on, when Amuako had his exhibition in LA and he invited me back to LA, and then I quit my job and then went to LA just to hang out and then see what's going on. So, so after having that conversation with Robert's project, he decided to offer me a residency as well so that I come there and work and also offer to take one of my work to Art Basel, which was one of my first major big art work members. Well, that's great. One of the reasons I was excited to bring you both together here, um, not only you were in the show together, but I, I love the way you each uh, interpret figure painting. And uh, obviously figurative artwork is so important today. And I think it's much more than a trend or an idea. It has such power and identity and you both bring a very different perspective to that. Uh, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about how, why figurative painting for each of you, like what, what made you start painting people? Well, first, I just want to say thank you, Otis, for the kind words about my work. And I feel the same about your work. It, it was just stunning. There's just a lot of feeling in the personas that you're capturing. I'm really curious about how you got started, you know, working in figurative painting. When, when I started drawing, I started with figures because it was a sort of a challenge for me. I always say, can I do this? Can I do this? And as time goes by, the love started to grow for me as in drawing people and all that. But when when I finally applied for art school, my focus was more of abstract and landscape. I loved abstract because I loved playing with colors. I love missing colors. It, abstract sort of gave me the freedom to create whatever I want, free the freedom to distort a figure, the freedom to, you know, put your wildest imagination to vision. But then once again, when I completed art school, I also took a photography lesson and I love black and white photography. So that is how figurative began for me. I thought like I can have more conversation when it, it has to deal with real people. So it's more of the connection and exploring the narrative of the person that you are painting? Yeah, most of the time when I started, it was just uh, random images that are very striking. Mm -hmm. But again, the conversation more started when interested in the stories of the people. Yeah, I, I can sense that. Like, well, I noticed that some of the titles of your paintings are like specific people, but then some of them are are like describing what they're wearing or like, um, and I love the painting that's behind you too, is amazing. I saw that on Instagram that you were working on that today. <laughs> and yeah. yeah, and I can really see like some of that abstract. And I mean, when you talk about loving abstract, to me that shows up with the big rectangular shapes that you have 
Yeah, definitely. I've noticed that um, your figures are, are largely like in the studio. Do you do photo shoots in the studio? Yeah, I do photo shoots in the studio most of the time. That is when I get to know somebody and they're comfortable coming to the studio. Because sometimes when you meet people in Italy, a little bit also skeptical, you know, not too confident. And it's one of the reasons why it's important that when I paint the person on my canvas, I project them as powerful and confident so that when they come in and then see the image, they feel proud about who they are and strong about who they are. But sometimes people are not always confident about who they are or how they look. So it's very important when you are representing somebody for larger people to see, you represent them well. You represent them in a strong way. Oh yeah, I, that's that really comes across in your work. I can definitely see that the people seem very confident and powerful. And and the girl behind you is holding a stone. She seems confident <laughs> and strong. Yeah. 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 <laughs> One of the things that I love about Laura's work is that the person is looking right at you, and it, it, it makes you. I just love the how it creates wonder in your ears, like who is this person? And you know, I just love that about about your work. And I will not stop talking about the strokes. The strokes just kills me. <laughs> and the colors are so rich and everything. Notice there is a lot of like water, maybe in a water bottle and there are some sort of is there a reason for that? I, well the gaze definitely um has worked its way into my work. And uh, previously I I would have people more engaged in some sort of activity or um, more focused on um, something that they're doing and, and maybe having the observer sort of um, invisibly there, you know, like they're implied. But I started to think that I wanted them to be more confrontational or more aware of, of someone being in their space. My whole series um, by herself just was really exploring women being in an environment where they're not normally um, expected to be alone. Like places that are feel forbidden and natural spaces that, you know, someone would advise you to not go by yourself, you know, take a friend, don't go by yourself. So I was having a lot of the figures looking to the side, you know, being aware that they might have to be on their guard. Then I started thinking, well, I wanted some of them to be, you know, preparing for or to to be more um, challenging and, and not accepting of that. That's where that gesture came in. Have you always loved figure painting? Yeah, actually, I really gravitated towards it. I mean, I, in college, I did a lot of different exploration, you know, as we all do. And um, I always loved the figure drawing. Um, the figure is always, even before college, you know, when I would draw as a kid, you know, it was always anything human figure, you know, mermaids. and. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, I've been wanting to um, incorporate them into the landscape more, and that's been challenging, like doing, you know, environments. And one thing that I also wanted to find out is that when you're starting your figure, do you sort of like work in layers? Because I realize your colors are also sort of like a thick on the cover. Do you work in layers, or it's just like a first application, you just apply it straightforward like that? Yeah, I actually, I don't work in layers. I work very directly. I, and I work where I really just placing the colors right adjacent to each other, you know, and building it from there very directly. So yeah, I don't, anytime that I've tried doing, you know, glazes, I I end up not being quite as happy about it as, <laughs> as if <laughs> I just left it alone. But yeah, how about you? Yours looks very directly painted. Or, yeah, like I said, I thought I'm the only person. <laughs> But yeah, I, I also go straight forward with fair supply. And um, I mostly don't plan for my background. The background sort of come later when I'm, I'm, I'm close to finishing the figure is the all when I'm done with the figure, then everything starts to come up. That's really interesting because I do the same. Like the figures are the most important thing and <laughs> I, I do them first too, yeah. Otis, how do you light your the figure? Is it sort of a natural conversation or is it more of like a formal setup? And I'll, Let me just switch this up a little bit. So I have my setup here. Oh, I see. Great. Yeah. yeah. 
where I have my lighting system. So I come and then uh, I make them sit with a pose that I want. First, first of all, when they come in, I let them sit comfortably on however they want to sit for me to capture that moment. So I take a photo of them in the clothes that they come in with before I dress them up. I also have a wrap over here. And you can see I have a wrap over there. Where oh, I have I my oh, yeah. I have my props and everything. So once I'm, I'm, I'm done taking photos of them with themselves, then I start to dress them up in a different way so that I have various photos to work with. Uh, I have a daughter who's 13, and so Laura came out to take pictures of her as a model. And she came with a, a shirt for my daughter, and they went out in the woods to get the, the at the right time of day. It was a lot of work to get this all um, <laughs> to get the lights. Exactly. Um, I don't know if you can see behind me, the new paintings have all these shadows on the faces. Yeah, amazing. It's just um, the light source and then the darkness where it's, it's, it's just, I have no idea how much I love it the first time I saw it. <laughs> Thank you. That's really, well, and I was looking through some of the work paintings on um, line and I was, really interested in um let me see if i can get the the side profile of david theodore do you know the painting I'm, and um yeah. but i saw that he had a band of light like i love the whole um david Thoreau cowboy series yeah like how he's doing with the color and then but the side profile it has the band of light across his eyes and so it's sort of indicating a kind of a map but like a bandit kind of thing yeah. But uh, I thought that was really interesting, your use of light in that piece. Yeah, it is one of the reasons why I love black and white photographies, because when you take a black and white photograph, it gives you the light source, it gives you where you're dark. It's just, it's plain and it's just there. Unlike taking the colored photos, you have different sort of lighting from different reflections for the calm reflections. So for me, I like it in black because I can actually see where my real light is hitting me, where the dark is over. Yeah, I, I, it looks to me like the figures, the skin color is like black from the tube. It's just like that pure black with different values and tones and, and that was that's really interesting to me when you have that like against your like the solid colors. When I was starting with that, I will this work together sort of like combining the grayscale color. It is. It's almost a, a play, a modern day grisaille painting, that sort of grayscale. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are there artists that you're looking to? I mean, um, behind me is Laura's Manet interpretation. Do you think about your work in context of a uh, larger history or political contemporary history or? I feel like in my generation, it's my responsibility as an artist to talk about my era. I look at the old masters like the Rembrandt. Mm -hmm. I just take a few ideas from them. That is where mostly it's about the gaze. I just look at how they are able to command attention. I like that. You're creating history. Yeah. <laughs> I think, Laura, your paintings speak for themselves in, in a way that they're reinterpreting history, especially taking on Manet's Dejeuner sur l'air, the luncheon in the grass, you know, you that's a very iconic painting. So revisiting it with a feminist and ecological point of view is unmistakable. Yeah, I definitely wanted to bring um, it in, into the now and putting my plastic basket <laughs> in there but then just having victorine by herself and not having the men that defined her you know in in the original manet painting at that time there was all different interpretations of of what the women in the painting because there's actually another woman in the background um bathing and i think the original title of that painting was the bathers and now I, I also want to know when choosing your models or figure, do you have specific people you choose or certain features you look out for? I started because I had um, the convenience of my daughter. I, I started painting her and her friends. And interestingly, I, I feel like I've kind of trained them 
I've followed them over the years. So many of them are in their 20s now, and I'm still, you know, when they come into town, they'll model for me. And just it's just nice because they're familiar with my process. And, you know, I don't have to really tell them to look a certain way. They kind of have an idea of what I want already. I mean, mostly I'm interested in just sort of the feminine presence, I guess. So do you also sort of like plan for the environment before choosing your uh, model or when you have your model before trying to find the location or the environment you want them to be? It's a little bit of both because um, I'm always constantly following the weather because everything I do is outdoors. <laughs> So, like, sometimes, like, there'll be an unpredictable, like, sunny day coming along, and I'm, like, dialing up all my models, like, are you available, are you available? <laughs> I can't always, like, be sure that I'm going to get a specific person on a, you know, specific day, but. And what are some of the difficulties you face doing that? You know, I, every painting is so different. I feel like I'm learning every, every painting kind of tells me what, you know, what is it that I'm going to do in the next scene. It really informs, like, it's those different challenges that you have during a painting. You're like, oh, I think I need to explore this more next time. And I, that's sort of been happening with the light. I started out with the dappled light and kind of wanting to, like, have parts disappear and parts reappear of the figure. And kind of breaking it apart and now I'm like chasing this really kind of extreme <laughs> dappled light to kind of break up the figure within it. Well I it. think it's one of the things I see um, and correct me here is in Otis there are almost sometimes even in the titles a portrait of an individual and for Laura the subject is sometimes even the light is the subject the light through the trees as is, is as important as the individual. Yeah, true. For me, when I see her works, the reflection, like the one behind her, the reflections and then the light source, it's just amazing how she works it. And, and like you said, sometimes, for me, that is where the focus is on more than the figure. And the two just blend into the back. It's so extraordinary how she works the light. And every time when I'm painting, the, it also teaches you, you learn something new. When I started during my residency, everything was just brush. My texture, my designs in the clothes, were, I was using brush. Until when I was about to, you know, go on a streak and then the brush just fell from my hand and then the bottom of it just scraped oh. the pink of the clothes. And it just popped an idea in my head. So I started sort of like etching the designs out of the clothes, the folds. And then that was it. Now I don't even paint the folds and all that. I have two that I use. So, so you learn every time. Yeah, I think that's what keeps it exciting. I think if you didn't yeah. have those like challenges, then you would just get bored, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And as a non-painter um, and viewing it, even though the, the way you're approaching them is different, there's definitely uh, you know that is Otis. You know that is you. Your point of view and how you bring the viewer along to, to see the person, it's unmistakable who's made that painting. I've always sort of tried to find my voice, I've always sort of tried to be different from other artists. I wanted people to recognize my work, even without my signature or even without my initial sample. So it's funny how it only happened recently. I used to paint in full color, but I felt it, it wasn't getting the attention that it needed to. Because when I went to LA, all the work that I did during my residence was, car, was colored until I decided to change it a little bit and then work in darker tones instead of the bright browns and the yellows. Oh. I started to work in darker tones. So when people came in there, they were more attracted or they were more focused on that image than the ones that I did. So then that made me realize that I have something that I should develop it more. So when I came back home, that is where I did my first car voice. So one image I painted in different color by different tones of grace. Well, I think it's always important to grow and keep moving and pushing yourself. There's room for you. There's room. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think you're really making a, a, 
a name with your your painting and I'm delighted to know them and see them here and uh, I don't need to wish you well you're already like blowing up you're it's great <laughs> to see I think um, it's important also the voice you bring um, is sort of explosive in color and joy and um, I like the way you talk about your generation. I, I think that there's something different than the African-American voice. You have a cultural language. Do you feel that at all? Yes, yes, because one, I have always, I have always loved fashion. Funny enough, I've been in the fashion industry for a while. I've modeled for a couple of fashion back home. I've been a model myself. I've been on the runway. <laughs> oh. Sometimes I go back and I look at it and I'm like, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think that played also played a part in my paintings. I've always, when I look at people dress up, I always imagine this kind of clothes on them. So I apply the same sort of method when I'm painting. I always want them to look super cool and different. But when I came here, and I, I go around town and I also take a look at how people dress around. The question was, how will I be able to fuse in my culture and then the culture here? Mm. So it was sort of applying my sense of fashion to it and making them look cool. It makes me think of the painting Black Feathers from the show at Marianne Bosky too, just how she wore those feathers and looked so fashionable. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Sometimes I put certain clothes on them that I wish I could wear, but I know it would not look good on me. So I'm like, okay, you wear this. <laughs> <laughs> and then it works perfectly. How do you think um, Portland weaves into that? Like, how do you like living there? Oh, I like living in Port Portland first of all. It's greenery and it's, it's beautiful. But Portland gave me the sense of peace when I come to the studio. My, my life here in Portland just from home to studio, studio to home. That's okay. it. Sometimes I just go out there just to see around how people are living. Yes, the, the Northwest style might be a little different than Accra. Oh yeah, definitely different. Because here, the weather also plays important because it's, when it's cold here, the dressing change, when it's winter, the dressing change. And in Ghana, it's always warm. So um, we are always in our local clothes and um, um, you know, just our shorts. The way we dress back home in Ghana, you can instantly tell the kind of person you just had a conversation with. Or when you meet someone, you can easily tell where he or she is from, which tribe she belongs to, by the way they dress, the color they choose. So some people wear certain colors and you can easily tell this person is from this tribe. Because we, everything that we do is sort of like, wanted to represent who we are. So it's important when people choose the clothes and the color of the clothes that they wear because it's something that represents them. And our, our prints, our materials for sewing clothes, they always have a proverbial meanings uh, written on the edge of it, right on the bottom of it. So when people are going out to buy cloth for designers to sew, them, they always look out for the meaning of that proverb. And then when it suits the type of person you have to buy. Yeah, so fashion is important, isn't it? Yeah, it is important. And color is important too to get so. Well, the Northwest, I grew up in California, Northern California, and the uh, sort of rugged outdoorsy is uh, very monochromatic and dark and woodsy colored. It's not the expressive color. Um, yeah. That yeah. you bring, I'm sure. When is your, what is your next exhibition? Um, Basel, which will be online, of course, because it will become COVID. <laughs> and um, it will be uh, with Robert Bridget, of course, and, um, a group show with Alvin Rich. It's also coming oh, great. Up. I think it's in uh, Hong Kong or Shanghai. Or something. This year, it's just a couple of two group shows. Out there. The rest is just indoors, working towards next year. Unfortunately, Corona just blocked a lot of things. And we are looking forward to next year and seeing, seeing, seeing good stuff happen. Well, we're looking forward to Laura's show, which opens in another two weeks. And um, we are still doing the live version and we'll supplement with some virtual experiences. 
Um, yeah, I wish I could come see because you do enjoy Lawrence work when you see it in person, in person than actual because you see it in person, you don't get to see all that fun stuff. Eh? So I wish Laura, I wish you the best with the exhibition. I know you're going to kill it. And um, too bad I can't see it back. Hopefully next year I can see something. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I wish I could come out and, well, of course, Basel. I'll have to check it out online. But yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for the conversation. It was such a pleasure getting to know you. Thank you for having me. And I really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Good to talk to you. Thanks. Good to talk to you. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. It's such a, a treat. I love your work and I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you, Laura. We'll, we'll, I'll follow up on Instagram. <laughs> okay. Good. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Talk to you guys later. All right. All right. Take care.